What does Jesus say about people who want fancy titles? That's what we're going to talk about today in Matthew 23. All right. Last time we got a lot of talking back and forth between the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and Jesus. They were trying to trick him, and he was trying to get them to think. Get them to think about what they've been doing and what they've been saying, and get them to realize that they don't know God's word in the way they think they do. So Matthew 23 starts out with Jesus talking to his disciples and says, you know what? The scribes, the Pharisees, they sit on what he calls Moses' seat. That's going to be the exalted seat that where Moses would sit in honor, watching over his people, saying, y'all think you're fancy and like Moses, where you're running everything so that they can sit there and pretend like they're saying the right thing and seeing the right things. But that is not the work they do. Makes me think of the fig. The fig's not producing figs. The tree is not living out its purpose. They're not living out their purpose either. So they preach, but they don't practice. They tie people up with heavy burdens. You know, they put them on the shoulders. Again, particularly the Pharisees were about making all sorts of rules so that, they, you know, again, the rules to sell that God was putting on people, that's a lot to do on their own. But now if you're putting rules around every rules, it's impossible. And I think in the end, they like the fact that everybody failed because if everybody fails, then I can waggle my finger at you and call you names. And if you do something I don't like, I can discredit you in front of the entire temple. It's not bad for people in a corrupt leadership to want everyone to be in trouble because that's how they can get people out of their ways. He says, but they're not willing to move a finger, not doing anything. They do all their deeds just to impress other people. Remember, we talked about how you shouldn't pray to impress other people. You shouldn't give to impress other people. You shouldn't fast to impress other people. That's what they're doing. Then he talks about the phylacteries were these scripture pieces that they would wear on their bodies. It comes from the Old Testament where it says that you should have the word of God on your mind. So they literally put it around their heads or the fringes on their robe were there to honor God, but they were doing it to be impressive. See how hard I work for you? See how I keep God's thoughts on my mind at all time right there in the phylactery? It was a way to impress people. You know, they get the best seats. They sit at the synagogue. They love when people see them at the marketplace, right? Hey. And they're supposed to be, he says, all brothers. He says that no man can be your father on earth. You have one father in heaven. He's not picking on fathers, by the way. And he's not even, according to what I read, telling people they should not be called father so-and-so, you know, like as a priest. He says, neither be called instructors, teachers, which I think comes from the word pastors and rabbis, but the greatest among you will be servants. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever is humbled will be exalted. That's ESV. And so the question I had when I first read this is, like, wait a minute. So should we not have priests calling themselves father so-and-so, or should we not have pastors Or should we not have rabbis? I mean, are we screwing this up? And basically the idea was, according to Spurgeon, that all these honors and titles were there so that they could take pride. It's the pride part that is forbidden. Because Jesus was called rabbi, and he didn't complain about it. Paul calls himself a father, and he calls other Christians his children. And Paul also says he's a teacher. You wouldn't think Paul of anyone would get this wrong. So the idea is, is that Paul's doing this not out of thinking himself important and not out of trying to make himself sound all cool and everything like that. Instead, he was using those titles to be more of a servant in every way that he possibly could. That's the part. And I think he was trying not to recreate the rabbi system, the scribe system, the Sanhedrin and all these people who had these sort of gloaty methods of them yelling at people, taxing people, stealing their property. It said, you know, in some parts of the Bible that the widows were being put out of their homes. Instead, he wants people to be servants in his ministry. 
And then he says, woe to you. I love the woes. Scribes and Pharisees, you're hypocrites. You shut people out of the kingdom of heaven. And you're not going to enter it either. And you won't allow other people to enter it because you travel everywhere. You proselytize. So you make other rabbis, you teach them about yourself. And it says, quote, you make him twice as much a child of hell as yourself. Wow. So that's something, you know, like I said, when I was in Israel, I went to lunch in Mia Sharim, which is where the Hasidim, which I think are modern day representatives of the Pharisee style of, you know, I'm not saying anything bad about them. They were very nice people, but they followed every rule. Um, I made the mistake of whipping out a 20 on Sabbath and learned you do not do that. So they tried very hard to do every rule. I guess I just wanted to pay for the meal, but no. But what he's saying is, is you make them twice as much a child of hell. What does that mean? We have seen people get extreme. Think about this. You know, they're all walking around in their groups and they are like thumbing their nose at Jesus and waggling their fingers at the apostles and Jesus. And Paul comes along and he is going around killing apostles. He is twice the child of hell of these older rabbis. You know, they basically created a monster of someone who was so taking off their ideas and running with it. He's even worse than they are. And the people they're creating are even worse than they are. You know, we've seen that where people will learn a lesson like, hey, you should do X, Y, and Z. And then the next generation of people come along and they're monsters about it. That's exactly what he's saying. You're making monsters here. And then he calls them blind guides. He says, if anyone swears by the temple, it's nothing. But if someone swears by gold of the temple, then it's bound by oath. You are blind. You know, remember before he was saying, if you can hear, hear. And if you can see, see. And now he's telling him, you're just blind. Because what's better? What's more important? The gold the temple is made of? or is it the altar? Is it the parts of it that are God's? And that's the part that matters. But you care about the gold. And you care about these gifts more than the altar itself. That's a really amazing point. And so whoever swears by the altar swears by everything. Whoever swears by the temple swears by it and by him who dwells in it. He who swears by heaven swears by the throne of God. Those are the oaths. Now, Jesus got done telling us not to do oaths, but to them, swearing by the gold was the most important part. This is where it talks about, I think, where Jesus was saying, it is hard for a rich person to go to heaven because they get obsessed with the gold instead of getting obsessed with the things of God. We learned in Matthew 15 that if a blind man leads a blind man, they both fall into a pit. And now he's saying they're all blind. Y'all are blind. And instead of doing what God has asked you to do. Then he goes on to say more woes. I think I forgot how many woes there were, but there's many woes. And so the next woe is you tithe mint, dill, and cumin spices, but don't care about the matters of justice, mercy, and faith. You care about the tithing. You don't care about the real issues here. and it said, and you should have done these things without neglecting people. And then he says, you blind guides, straining out the gnats and swallowing the camel. You are, it's like that log and the plank thing that he said on the Beatitudes. You're trying to pick a speck out of someone's eye and ignoring the log in your own eye. You're trying to get rid of the gnats, the little things. And instead, you're missing the camel and swallowing the camel whole. That's pretty good imagery. <laughs> He says that you like these whitewashed tombs and they're full of dead bones. They're all unclean. And what they used to do is they would clean these tombs on the outside. And I guess it was primarily so that you would be able to see a tomb from very far away. So you didn't accidentally cross if you were part of the tribe of Levi and cross in front of a tomb. So they would clean them up. But he's saying that no matter how much you clean up a tomb and make it shine on the outside, it is filled with dead bones. You are just, he said, righteous to other people. Again, you do all these things to be impressive and instead you're just full of 
quote, hypocrisy and lawlessness. Whoa. And I think throughout Jesus' entire ministry, I think through all of Matthew, if we didn't hear that Jesus wants us to have mercy for people, that we shouldn't have faith in God, that we should have forgiveness for other people, that we should treat people well, that was a message we've been hearing this whole time. But they're worried about whether or not you might read a book on Sabbath or turn your oven on or try to let your kids play on Sabbath. See, I'm still bitter about the Sabbath thing, but you're sitting there worried about these minuscule issues and forgetting about the important things of mercy, forgiveness, faithfulness, all the things. And then we have a new woe. He says, you hypocrites, you build the tombs of the prophets and decorate monuments of righteousness and say that if we lived in the days of the father, you know, people in the Old Testament, we wouldn't have done all the things that happened to them because the prophets, if you recall, Jesus said no prophet is welcome in his own home. The prophets were murdered. They were killed for what they said. And instead, he, you know, they're saying we wouldn't have done that. We would love the prophets. And he's calling them a brood of vipers again and saying, I'm going to send you prophets. I'm going to send you wise men. I'm going to send you scribes and you're going to kill. You're going to crucify. You'll flog some of them. You'll persecute them. And so all that are going to come will have their righteous blood shed. So all the way from A to Z, Abel to Zechariah, blood was shed. I like the A to Z. And you murdered all of them. All these things are going to come in this generation. You're going to kill more of them. I mean, you know, they didn't kill John the Baptist, but they sat there on the fringes of this. They plotted about it, you know, and so they were not exactly supporting him either. They think they're going to support prophets. They don't support prophets any more than the people back then supported prophets. And then he sad for Jerusalem. I mean, imagine this is supposed to be the city of God, the place where everyone comes to worship God where the focus is God. And I read in the other podcast, Small Steps with God, about how Jerusalem was supposed to be this place. But in the time of Micah, he called them bloodthirsty and not seeking justice. And Jerusalem was built on all the bad things at that point. You know, it was supposed to be this amazing city of God, and it didn't end up that way. And so he laments about it. And he said, How many times have I said, gather your children together as hens gather her brood? And you weren't willing. I told you to come get your people, to care for your people, to to be the pastor of these people. And now he's saying, you know what? You're not going to see me again until you'll say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Meaning, again, blessed means happy or how great it is for those people who see who come in the name of the Lord. This time is coming to an end. And Jerusalem, you screwed up. (laughs) There you go. So my meditation this week is going to be about the ways I try to look good to other people or more important to other people or not look like what God wants me to look at. Are there things that I do that separates me from people because I'm trying to put out an image? And I'm going to think about that this week. And so my prayers are going to be about that too. Are there ways that I'm putting phylacteries on my head and fringes on my robe? I mean, I'm not doing any of those things, but something in a modern sense, am I doing anything like that? Am I being hypocritical or looking for status in any way possible? So that's going to be uh, my prayer again this week. And what I'm going to share is the idea that we shouldn't do things for show. We shouldn't pray, fast, give, doll up our things with gold, and swear by those things of gold, that we should be people that are focused on God and not focused on images of people, their outside appearances, their titles, the way they dress, the things that they show us about themselves. We're not supposed to be impressed by those things, but instead be servants to each other. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. Please remember that you can always go to my website, which is The Bible in Small Steps. Still building it together, but I hope that it's going to be a resource for you. And there's a new website. The network of this entire podcast and all my podcasts is at abetterlifeinsmallsteps.com. Get it? Bliss. 
And the idea is that this is going to be a blog my friend is going to be writing. And it's going to be a place where you can find all my podcasts, ways to listen. And it's going to be the future of almost every resource for every podcast out there, other than the blog articles themselves. Thanks so much for listening and have a wonderful day. 